Once there was a man. Yes, it can. Once there was another. Brothers of the blood. Each the others. That last week. Current events tonight has invited four guests from the Gay Community Services Center. They're here to discuss the gay liberation movement as individuals. They in no way claim to represent the entire gay movement, either in Los Angeles or in the rest of the country. What is the Gay Community Services Center? Very simply, there is no public or private human service agency which is willing to provide services to gay individuals. They're either unwilling or incapable of doing this. And it became very clear to, to many activists in the gay community that if the needs of our gay brothers and sisters were going to be met, we were going to have to do it ourselves. Okay. Hopefully, 5, 10, 15 years from now, uh, these public agencies will be more sensitive to the needs of gay individuals. As of 1971, they're not. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear that we're going to have to provide these services, a whole range of services from personal counseling, job referrals, VD clinic, what have you. Uh, we are providing these services free of charge to our brothers and sisters uh, through the community center. I would like to add only, I think, that um, within the last couple years, there's a great new excitement and happiness, sense of fulfillment emerging in the gay community. And this comes out of our getting in touch with who we are internally as gay people. And one of the purposes of the center is to begin to share this new development, to make it more widely available to all gay people. And that is an important part of what we do at the center, is that ecstatic experience of knowing who you are once and for all. And large numbers of our brothers and sisters gather at the center in the daytime, but there are meetings every evening, just to share that ecstasy. Just to say, I am gay and I am proud and Boy, that's beautiful, and, and I don't want to not to let the world share in that ecstasy. And that's an exceedingly beautiful, healthy thing. I think what Mars is touching on is, is extremely important, because I, I think this is what's happening within the gay community here in Los Angeles, certainly, and around the country, is the fact that for the first time in history, gay people are beginning to define themselves. No longer are we allowing the mental health industry Accommodations, uh, clergymen, law enforcement officers to define who we are. We're doing it ourselves. And in the process, uh, we've embarked on one of the most, or I've embarked on one of the most exciting periods in my life. And what I'm, uh, what's coming out of this for me is a very positive self image for myself. At this point, I think many of us feel that we have a great deal that we can teach to our non gay brothers and sisters that out of this process, this liberation process that we've gone through, this very unique process of defining ourselves, we've learned a great deal. And we're at the point right now that we want to share it with everybody. I'm curious about something. I read something the other day that was a quote, and I'd like to share it with you and ask you what you feel about it. The quote reads, homosexuality is a full-time matter, a human status, and that's the tyranny of it. In that... Uh phrase, I find a, a subtler kind of a thing, perhaps. Don and Morris and Dick and myself, all of us, sometimes say at the end of a day where we have five conferences, four meetings, a television program, and a speaking engagement, and this is every day of our lives, my dear, this goes on, and we just look at each other and say, good heavens, I'm so tired of being gay. You know, what that means when we say it, though, mm -hmm isn't I'm tired of the exhilarating experience of manifesting a possibility of human happiness and ecstasy and sharing and so on that's been kept under a lid for too long. It's not a response to that. It's a response of, look, humanity, I'm tired of your separating me out. I'm tired of your not knowing yourself enough to know that that thing that we show you is your own soul, is your own being, is your own possibility. And the weight of invalidation, constant invalidation from all areas of society is a heavy one. Uh, many times we make a distinction between the term homosexual and gay. Homosexual is a scientific term which has been laid on us by the scientific community. 
It defines us in very narrow sexual terms. Added to this is the tremendous economic uh, uh, position of, of, of the mental health industry. People in this city of Los Angeles, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, are making a fortune off of the gay community, trying to help them with a problem which they created, the mental health industry created in the first place. Our community is being bled dry. You know, I think the uh, mental health professionals don't understand the kind of freedom I was talking about just a minute ago that we're now experiencing, that I was experiencing in terms of my trial. I think they probably haven't made any effort to try to understand this freedom. They will, for example, still say, well, given the, f as some of them, given the fact, uh, there, there may be nothing sick about being homosexual, but given the fact that uh, the homosexual has such a difficult time in so society today, it would really be an advantage if we could divert somebody at a young enough age away from this route. And uh, I say, uh, you know, in my case, I am free now as a homosexual. I feel awfully good about it. My life is exciting. For some therapist at an early age to have rerouted me would have been a terrible sin. Uh, to have robbed me of all the excitement I have now from being gay is the worst thing anybody could have done when I was a young person. Our experience has been that uh, non-gay academicians, people from the mental health industry, come towards us pretty much as colonial administrators. I mm -hmm. mean, we, we, we could be Kikuyu uh, people in Kenya dealing with the, with the British administrator there. They come very condescending, paternalistic, the whole trip is that indeed uh, the actuality of 1971 is at this point the academic community, the mental health industry, the law profession, what have you, they simply are not willing to listen. And this is what gay people are beginning to say. Wait a minute, we're no longer going to allow that to happen to us. Now we're going to begin defining ourselves. We're going to be telling you what it's like. And it's a very difficult thing for many of the academicians and, and people in the mental health industry to, to pick up on. And isn't it true in many cases that they claim to know you better than you know yourself? I, oh, please. There are so many issues, you know, involved when you start talking about something like uh, gay liberation. And one of the issues, of course, is how outrageous we are. Well, we become more outrageous every day. And I think <laughs> that probably the most outrageous thing about us and the first time I said it, I felt uncomfortable, but the third and fourth time I said it, I found myself believing it because it's true. And that's that we're not part of the solution. We are the solution. Now that's a heavy rap to lay on people. Our sexuality, as we're exhibiting it, is the solution. Why that's heavy is because the majority culture in this society has totally failed to deal with their own sexuality, They've bought the whole tyranny that they're living under. They're acting out the complete self-destructive trip of things like Vietnam and so on and so on, all of which can be analyzed in terms of their inability to get into what sexuality is all about. Sexuality, ecstasy, nirvana, consciousness, all that, they're all wrapped up in the same thing. And until you can begin to exhibit freely whatever it is that you feel, you're going to have the kinds of social pathologies rampant, just as they are in our own culture. And coming into that discovery, as at least the four of us have, is a very, very lonely place to find yourself and a very, very frightening place to find yourself. You feel, as we've often said, like the first man had to feel when his tail fell off or when he discovered, oh, look, oh, I can do it, you know. <laughs> and you look around and you see all the hair-colored cavemen and Neanderthals and you know they're out to kill you because you're a positive mutant. I think we're at the uh, brink of a sexual revolution and uh, we have some contributions to make to this revolution. Uh, it has to do with sex roles roles as men and women, as male and female. Uh, somebody has said that the woman that most needs liberation is the woman that each man has locked within the breast of, of himself, and that when that woman is freed, 
uh, a sexual revolution of unprecedented proportions will take place. Now, I think, wow. I think that uh, gay people uh, have an easier chance at unlocking that woman. Uh, we have less cultural baggage that keeps the locks there. We, for example, as we circulate among our uh, uh, peers, do not have the regular social reinforcements that say, in order to be a male, you have to do A, B, C, D. If we want to cry, we can cry. If we want to cook, we can cook. There's a few things that keep us from getting in touch with the component in ourselves, the woman if it's a man, the man if it's a woman, and begin to express all of what is human mm -hmm. within us. Uh, and as I say, I think because we are in the fortunate position of having less cultural baggage to deal with, it's e this revolution is easier for us. It's not that anybody else can't be a part of it too, but uh, we perhaps have a head start. What would be ideal would be a future idea would be a separation of the gay community from, from the heterosexual community? Oh, heavens no. Mm -hmm. um, would be an that integration. That separation which has occurred uh, has nothing to do uh, with our own volition. I mean, we've been rejected, pushed out, stomped on, everything else is worse than lepers ever had it. Mm -hmm. uh, we are removed from children, uh, all of that. And I think what Don is saying, and what I am saying also, what we're all saying, is that, now think about it. If you have come to the point where you can be objective enough and courageous enough and not hung up enough to recognize that there's nothing on God's green earth wrong with, homosexual, with homosexuality, with manifesting love of your own sex. I mean, all the animals are doing it, the trees are doing it, the flowers are doing it, everything in God's universe are doing it, we're doing it too. When you open your eyes and you see that, and then you say, this is what these people are doing, and then you look, and oh my God, what are we doing? Heterosexual community, what are we doing? If they're all right, what's our story? Mm -hmm. Note of caution. Well, it I becomes, the story is a stifling thing, it's a problem, there's something wrong in the heterosexual community, something very wrong. Uh, yeah, and I proselytize a lot and evangelize a lot and try to spread it around a lot, and sure, I'm interested in getting to little kids young, before they become stifled, before they become maimed, deranged, and limited. It was necessary for me to become a separatist. It was necessary for me at a certain point in my life to withdraw and say, no, I need to get in touch with my own feelings. I need to go through some personal growth. I want to deal with my reality for a change rather than having to deal with your reality. And I did withdraw, and I think it was good for me. I did separate myself. Now, I'm at a point right now where I, I feel that I want to share what I've learned in the last two or three years. Again, even the dichotomy of, you know, of, of gay community, non-gay community isn't real for me because I belong to many communities. Mm -hmm. I belong to the gay community. I belong to the counterculture community. I belong to the white poor community. Uh, I, you know, I belong to the academic community. I belong to many, many mm -hmm. different types of communities, and I'm in and out. I, but right. in each of those, you have to deal with your gayness. Yeah. Because if you come into those communities, the ones uh, that Don just outlined, if you come into those communities as heterosexual, then that's clearly defined. Heterosexuals don't have to wear buttons saying, I'm, I'm a het and I'm proud. Because they traditionally have not suffered oppression for that, you see. But gay people do have to proclaim that, and I think we'll have to continue to for a good long period of time until that's established. Once for all, as a psychic realization, a self-realization, an outgrowth, an outreach to the het community and to ourselves, convincing first with ourselves. This is why in those communities it's important to say, I'm gay, because if you don't, somebody will come and tell them. And some person whose consciousness is a little low will say, well, wait a minute, you know, there are 12 guys living here in this uh, interesting commune, and it turns out one of them's gay. So well, we knew that all along because he told us the day he came. And this is the same thing I think about the government service, the police department, the army, everywhere else. I think it's important for us to say who we are simply because we've so long been the subjects of blackmail. 
But I hope, though, that soon we'll outgrow that and we won't need to, uh, uh, that will simply, simply be irrelevant. It'll be self-affirmative. First, I want to talk about the fact that are you going to establish yourself separately as a political power group? I, I think you have conventional political tactics being used. For instance, here in Los Angeles, we have the Gay Community Alliance. In New York, there's the Gay Activist Alliance into a fairly conventional and, and, and positive uh, political trip. Uh, I think, on the other hand, what you're, what you're seeing manifest itself is a much broader concept of politics. I think the Gay Community Services Center mm -hmm. would fall into that category. Mm -hmm. uh, encouraging people to be themselves in this society is a political act. Encouraging people to define their own humanity is a political act. Encouraging gay people to come out to Griffith Park on a Saturday afternoon and enjoy themselves in public is a political act. For me to walk down the street holding the hands of somebody I love is a political act. That we're, that we're no longer dealing with the straight man's concept of politics, which is power plays and manipulation, but we're broadening that concept of politics and we're saying simply for me to reach out and, and manifest love for Morris is a political act in this society. And, and we're, we're dealing with a whole new range of, of political activity. It is a political yeah. act because uh, it could be interpreted as a felony which could easily throw us both in jail, and they would have to go through the law courts and prison and probation and parole and the whole trip, you see. So that innocent little act... You mean his taking your hand? That's right. Mm -hmm. it, it could be interpreted, you see, as, as lewd behavior. You have been involved and you are currently involved with these laws. I was arrested on June, on July 17 in the city, and like John, we're going to take this to trial in the jury trial. Uh, the response from the community is beautiful. Almost every organized uh, gay group in town has issued statements of support. They've cooperated with the fundraising. It's been a source of unification within the gay community. Uh, we need to fight our oppression, and we're doing it together in instances like this. Our line of defense will be similar to John's. Uh, the individual vice cop is lying about what actually took place. This means he's guilty of perjury. And secondly, the uh, p uh, police department in the city has an organized uh, conspiracy against the gay community to harass us. And we'll try as best we can to bring in the documentation for those charges. What is your relationship with the police department, officially and non-officially? Um, I find that in either no official or unofficial way is the police cooperating with the gay community. I find it just the opposite. I can think of no other minority group within Los Angeles City which is getting as bad treatment from the Los Angeles Police Department as the gay community. Uh, at no time have they been willing to talk to members of the gay community. Now when I say talk, I mean saying something about, well, we're going to do this, and yes, we recognize this is a problem, and we're going to work with you to solve that problem. Never once has that happened. Uh, my gay brothers and sisters are being harassed in the bars, they're being harassed on the streets, they're being unjustly arrested, they're being beaten up. Uh, I, I take the opposite point of view. Everything that we have done has been in spite of official police cooperation. Uh, I, I think that there has been no qualitative change in, in, in uh, gay community police relations in Los Angeles over the last five years. I think that this is an even more devastating and searing thing than even Don presented with the emotion that he gave to it because we're talking about billions of dollars of wasted human resources. We're talking about bail bonds, attorney fees, time in court, uh, probation, parole, investigation. We're talking about loss of, of, of family connections. We're talking about possible loss of apartment or home. We're talking about loss of self-respect. We're talking about a gradual erosion. This is in the case of harass, intimidation, harassment, or possible imprisonment. We're talking about years and years of erosion of self. I can't apply for that job because I have a police record. That's right. I won't be able to get a passport because I have a police record. We're talking about... I can't get married because, right because uh, my, my companion will find out. Right this on. enormous, devastating erosion, it's a horrendous crime against us. And we're talking about... 21,000 people a year. Now, I wanted to ask you about those figures. You said 1,500? Yes, it's 1,750 a month at the current time in metropolitan Los Angeles. Where are you getting those figures from? Uh, from the statistical analysis, the police departments publish reports from time to time. Their own work, their own reports. And uh, while they don't mail them to us, uh, certainly, uh, uh, <laughs> we sometimes find out from people who are friendly with us in various statistical agencies what they are, and we keep compiling it, you see, and keep watching it. 
And there is one note of encouragement there, Don. It was 5,000 a month 10 years ago. And the attorneys who deal in the field tell me that because of us and our kind of activity and other gay outfits, agents in this community, and a growing awareness, consciousness, the entire liberation movement of all oppressed peoples that's been falling. Mm -hmm. We're delighted yeah. with that, but well, that's before, not good enough. Before leaving here, you should be fully aware, though, that, that what we're talking about is the 15 to 20 attempted suicides that we have to deal with every week of people who, who are at that point as a direct, immediate result of police brutality and harassment. There are today mm -hmm. political candidates who are courting various, various gay groups. Um, Right, I'd and like, I think I, I'm I'd glad like you used you the word courting because, uh, you know, the same thing is happening to the gay community, which has happened to the black, Chicano community, what have you, any minority community, is a political shuck and jive. The right now, gay people are becoming more public, more open. Uh, we're, we're, we're becoming more of a political force to be reckoned with, and politicians are beginning to make uh, uh, turns in, in our direction. The important thing here is the fact that we're being given nothing, absolutely nothing except some good words. Elaborate um, about that. Right, well, uh, what, I, what I feel is happening, I mean, we have the case here in Los Angeles of, of several city councilmen uh, for the first time in their lives, uh, city councilmen living in districts which have very high uh, 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 proportion of gay people living in this, these districts. For the first time, they're beginning to take notice of the fact that there are gay people living there. All they're saying is, there are gay people living in our, in, our, in our districts, and they have problems, and we have to address ourselves to them. Never once do they get specific saying, we are going to do this. We feel the injustices that you are suffering from the vice department is intolerable, and we are going to suggest that the budget, that part of the police budget dealing with vice operations, be deleted in the next fiscal year. We don't hear anything from that. All they keep giving us is lip service, saying, we are interested, please come to us if we can be of any help to you. Councilman Snyder, you've recently made several statements and public appearances that indicate your support for the gay community. What do you see as the most pressing issue facing that community? Well, I, to tell you the truth, uh, uh, I don't think it, it's uh, proper to say support for the gay community. That tends to categorize uh, all of the people who are uh, homophile as uh, in a single category. No, I, do, I don't support the gay community, the small portion of, uh, the small portion of the gay community, uh, which is antisocial in behavior. I support the, uh, uh, the uh, great bulk of the gay community, which is uh, li live lives like everyone else uh, in a perfectly normal day-to-day uh, -day type of living. Uh, just as I support every type of citizen of the city, uh, particularly of my district. Uh, the great bulk of homosexuals in our community um, are not a great deal different from anyone else. That uh, They live their lives uh, uh, in the way that other people live them, uh, with some modifications that, uh, that go with their sexual lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But uh, that uh, they're, they, they live as good neighbors, they belong to the local uh, uh, local uh, church, uh, uh, to the service club, to the veterans organization. They're active in the Improvement Association locally uh, and are involved in community life. How do you feel about the relationship between the LAPD and the homosexual community? Well, uh, between uh, the homosexual community, I, I, I would say that uh, um, that uh, the relationship between the Los Angeles Police Department and homosexuals in general in our society is about the same as it is with heterosexuals because most uh, have no problem with the police and are grateful to the kind of protection that the police department give. What I think we should be looking for is a, is a, a better level of, of communication between the police and the, and the organized homosexual community for two reasons. To, to uh, allow the police department to uh, explain why they're doing what they're doing, uh, which sometimes is misunderstood by uh, the gay community, and also to allow uh, the organized homosexual uh, groups to uh, give the kind of input to the police department that will enable them uh, to enforce the, the rules which society gives them to enforce. Now the in thing for them to scream, I'm a homosexual, look at me, uh, am I not wonderful? Well, there is no entrapment. 
and there is no great amount of enforcement. There's probably not enough enforcement. I think it's their guilty consciences that is really harassing them, uh, not the police.